Hey everybody, today I'll be talking about liquid metals, which has been the subject of my PhD dissertation, but has been an emerging and useful functional material in material science. Now the most common example that you've seen for liquid metals is, of course, the Terminator liquid metal robot. But I am not talking about those, instead I'll be talking about gallium-based liquid metals and some of their functional uses. So what are they used in? Most commonly, PC enthusiasts and gamers and other people who uh, look into thermal management have been using liquid metals as part of a thermal management solution for cooling their CPUs. Uh, a very common example of this is using Thermal Grizzly, uh, which supplies a liquid metal and liquid metal based materials as a thermal interface material. And these thermal interface materials enable uh, CPUs and other packaging components to uh, more effectively draw heat away from the chip, enabling it to stay cool and run at optimal speed. Now, of course, this is the most common example of the liquid metal, but it has also been used uh, more recently in stretchable electronic applications, biomedical applications in drug delivery or cancer treatments, and also 3D printing. But in today's video, I'll be talking a little bit more about the science aspect of liquid metals, what sort of properties that they actually have, and what drawbacks limit the applications of liquid metals. But before I begin, remember to like, comment, and subscribe to this channel for more material science and grad school content. So liquid metals that are based on gallium are non-toxic compared to a more commonly used liquid metal in thermometers such as mercury. And gallium is one of the lowest melting point elements on the periodic table, with a melting point just around 30 degrees Celsius, which is only slightly above room temperature. Now, gallium can also be alloyed with other elements such as indium or tin uh, to create what's called a eutectic alloy. And this eutectic composition means that it can readily shift from its liquid state to a solid state once it's reached its eutectic temperature. And this eutectic temperature uh, is highly dependent on the overall composition of the alloy. So you may end up getting the lowest point at a very specific compositional ratio between the elements that you add together. Now these gallium-based liquid metals also have incredibly high surface tension. So if you were to place a drop onto a surface, it would essentially beat up into a sphere, which is generally the lowest energy state of a liquid droplet. And this high surface tension can uh, cause it to be very difficult to spread across different surfaces as people in the uh, gaming industry have been uh, looking into using liquid metals as tims. They often find that these liquid metals uh, have to be stirred or uh, rigorously applied in order to spread uh, across different surfaces on their computer chip. Aside from that, it is also a very dense material, so one of the more dense fluids out there. Aside from its density and high surface tension, it actually is having the consistency close to water. So it's a very low viscosity material, meaning that it can flow very easily and dispensed via a syringe or some other application device. Now, one very interesting aspect of liquid metals, which I explored uh, in part for my PhD dissertation, is its ability to form a self-limiting oxide layer. Now, of course, that's just a bunch of jargon, but what exactly does that mean? Now, an oxide forms when a material reacts with oxygen. In the case of gallium, it forms an oxide called gallium oxide, which covers the surface of the liquid metal much like uh, the skin of milk when you leave it out for too long. And this oxide is actually quite important for dictating some of the properties of liquid metal, how it spreads, how it flows, and how it can attach to other surfaces. This oxide formation is also what enables liquid metal droplets to be broken up into microscale or even nanoscale particles. And this is because the oxide is able to readily rupture under mechanical stress and completely reform as long as it's exposed to oxygen. And this enables the liquid metal to essentially uh, form a self-passivating core shell architecture when it is broken up into smaller and smaller droplets. And this makes it incredibly useful for applying a bulk liquid metal into more micro or nanoscale applications simply by dispersing it into droplets of those length scales. Now this oxide formation is also incredibly important for 
adhesion onto different surfaces because of the adhesive qualities of this oxide, but also enables particles and other materials that are non-wetting, meaning that liquid metals cannot spread, easily spread over the surface, to attach onto the liquid metals. And this was also a subject of part of my work where I can show that non-wetting particles can blend into liquid metals to form these liquid metal-based mixtures simply by generating enough oxide content to essentially enable the wetting process of these particles to occur. So how do we make a liquid metal? In general, these liquid metals are simply produced by melting gallium, so transitioning it from its solid to liquid state, but you can turn it into a eutectic alloy simply by adding another element to the gallium mix. So here, I'm going to show you how to make a eutectic gallium indian alloy simply by adding these two materials together. So to make a eutectic gallium indium alloy, first I melt elemental gallium into its liquid state, like you see here. Then I transfer the molten gallium into a block of 25 weight percent indium to make this eutectic gallium indium alloy. Then to demonstrate the power of this oxide and changing the shape and functionality of liquid metals, let's take a bulk liquid metal and transform it into a series of micro to nanoscale particles. So to turn this larger liquid metal droplet into micro or nano sized particles, I first put the liquid metal, which you see on the bottom here, into a small vial of ethanol. And then I place it into this ultrasonic bath that you see here. So I place the vial in a small styrofoam floating um, device, which then I can just suspend on top of the bath. And then I go ahead and switch it on. Now it's a little hard to see, but the ultrasonic bath is essentially sending sound waves to shear the liquid metal droplet into smaller and smaller droplet sizes. Over time, this will eventually become a relatively homogeneous mixture of micro and nano sized particles. Now this is what the particles look like. Pretty cool. Now, there's certainly many advantages of using a liquid metal being a deformable conductive material, but there are also quite a few drawbacks. One of which is something that people uh, in the PC industry have probably already experienced, and that is called liquid metal embrittlement. So when you place a liquid metal on top of a, an aluminum substrate, the aluminum uh, over time, uh, and this is generally a very rapid process, can actually transform from a relatively ductile or uh, something that can absorb impact and a relatively strong material into a material that has more brittle qualities, which means that it can break very easily under very low mechanical stress. And this is what liquid metal embrittlement does, where the liquid metal essentially diffuses in between the different atomic grains in the material and causing them to cleave or split apart. And this is what causes the ultimate failure of aluminum substrates. So simply applying the liquid metal onto aluminum can completely destroy the material over the course of hours. And here I'm gonna quickly demonstrate this while placing a liquid metal on top of a sheet of aluminum foil. So here, this aluminum foil, I'm just gonna place a small droplet of liquid metal. As you can see here. And we're gonna go check on it in a few hours. So as you can see that over time, the liquid metal droplet actually starts to discolor and it's slowly working its way through the aluminum. And would you look at that? Complete corrosion. Now, there are also a couple of misconceptions when considering applying liquid metal onto other types of transition metals, such as copper, nickel, or even silver. Copper and nickel are fairly common metals used in a microelectronics package, and they're generally what consist of the integrated heat spreader lid and also some of the components for heat sinks. Certainly, there's a lot of talk in different forums about uh, whether or not copper and nickel can corrode under liquid metal, but I want to also clear up some of those misconceptions simply by looking at how liquid metal interacts with these metals on a chemical and physical perspective. So gallium has a strong affinity for many different transition metals, meaning that it can very readily form a room temperature alloy with a different metal as long as they are in contact over time. So in the case of gallium and copper, 
they form a copper digallium uh, atomic structure and this alloy material essentially consumes the liquid metal and copper at the interface where they meet and essentially form a new uh, solid species that may introduce potentially unwanted properties for whatever you're trying to work on. So in that sense, it doesn't necessarily corrode the copper per se, but the liquid metal alloys with the copper when in contact with a copper uh, surface or substrate, and this can cause changes in the surface texture or also properties of the liquid metal or copper itself. While gallium and copper is a very common example of this, you can see this happen with many other transition metals, and the rates at which this happen can occur um, uh, at different length scales. So with copper, it's generally in the order of days to weeks. With nickel, same time frame. With something like stainless steel, it may also take a little bit extra time, but with silver, it act actually occurs quite rapidly. And of course, if you are interested in using liquid metals for your PC gaming setup and for uh, improving the thermal management of your system, certainly explore uh, liquid metal as an option, but keep all of the material interactions and corrosion possibilities in mind. But with that, this is my very brief material science primer on gallium-based liquid metals, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Please leave a comment below if you want to see me discuss other elements, other materials, and if you want to have other suggestions for videos on my channel. But until next time, keep calm and exiton.